I never really got to experience a summer at all after the age of 13. Okay, just let us know like when you leave the dorms and you can go explore New York City. I was 15. We won the national championship my sophomore year. It's your entire life up to that point. The thing is, is like you knew yours was the last time you were gonna play basketball. I didn't know my last time I was gonna step on stage. And that was the last time I stepped on stage. What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of It's Finally Nighttime Podcast. Layla is sleeping, Yep. so the parents will come down and have a podcast, obviously. Yep, it is episode five. Episode five. We've got a full month. That's crazy. Pulling out episodes. Yeah. And today, we're kind of going a little bit back in history. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about? So today, we're going to be talking about our kind of our sports and athletic careers that we did in high school and college, college for you, not for me, but kind of how ballet and basketball were our lives and what happened and why we're not going through and why that changed, why everything changed. Yeah. Yeah. But first off, I'd like to say thank you to everybody that (laughs) that is first has joined us today. And also that has also, 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 (laughs) also, have watched our previous episodes. They have yeah. been actually going pretty well. They have been. And these are a blast to make. So I'm very excited to keep this going. And if you guys have like any thoughts or like I guess any comments on what you want us to talk about next or, you know, we we like that. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Put that in the description below. Yes. Comments below. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's been a night. It has been a night. But anyways, do you want to start? Should we talk about you first? Sure. We yeah, we can go back and forth too. Okay. So see where the questions. Yeah. So how did you start basketball? Oh man, that's a great question. Yeah. How and when? So as far as my interest in basketball, it started when I know specifically when I was three years old. My grandma Lil, who oh, is still grandma. alive, she's 93 years old. God bless that woman. She bought me a little Tex basketball hoop for my birthday. Oh, those like little blue and yes, blue it's red the ones. one that's still at my parents' house today. It's still oh works. that one. Yes. Oh, those kids still play with those. <laughs> yeah, 100. percent So she bought me it, and I just play with it every single day from like what I can remember. And I remember also like growing up would uh have make like my own sports games i'd be playing against myself and i played on that thing all the way up until probably like 10 years old really yeah so that's how my interest got started but when i started to play like competitively quote unquote probably five years old at ymca really yep. did you guys have like an actual an actual basketball hoop outside or did you yes you yes did? um so my brothers both played basketball off and on throughout grade school and junior high They both stopped in in high school, but yeah, so my dad got a portable hoop and so had many hours out there. One of my most fond memories with that was just that waiting for like the snow to melt Mm -hmm. and it would still be like wet and stuff outside. And so I remember being out there as soon as, you know, it'd still be wet, be shooting, whatever else, dribbling, and the ball would just be soaked with mud. Yeah. Um, but I was just happy to be outside and be able to shoot outside again. So you started competitively, you said, you went like this, when yes. you were five. Yep. And was that like you were traveling as well, or was it no. just for fun? So much? for when you're five years old, you're just playing, going to practice, I think, once a week, once okay. or maybe twice a week, and then having games on Saturday mornings and... Okay. You can travel and do all sorts of stuff, like actually like violations. <clears throat> yeah. You know, but everybody just wants to get you involved and kind of yeah. kind of get like the spark going if you are interested in it. Exactly. I'm pretty okay. sure that's what how most get started around the country okay. is just YMCA basketball. But oh, okay. yeah. So how do you start with dance? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so I started dance when I was also three. I think I was three, four. And it actually, my dad and I used to always dance to Elvis in the living room together. And that's like one of my favorite memories. We have like pictures of me. I was like wearing my underwear and we're just like dancing together. And we would always dance together playing Elvis. 
And so that's kind of how my parents were like, okay, we need to put her in dance. And so I was around like three, four years old when they put me into dance. And it was just your typical, I think it was an hour ballet class once a week. And that's all it was. Mm -hmm. And we had our old, um, it was at our old studio. And it's kind of next to our new studio now. Um, But we had my dance teacher, Mrs. Gasper, who's the owner of Gasper School of Dance and Performing Arts. And her husband also owned it too, Eddie Gasper. And it was such a small studio and there was like not that many people at the time that were there. Now there's a lot of kids that are there. I think it's like over three, 300 or 500 kids that are at that studio. There's two different locations. Anyways, that's kind of how I started. And I was doing the recital just for fun that you'd always have at the end of the year. That's just like showcasing what you do. And then you'd have just like random shows here and there that were just like Coppelia shows, which is like a ballet or you would have the Nutcracker, which the Nutcracker at the time, we didn't start that yet. But yeah, that's kind of where my love for it was. My dad and I always danced together, and then I got put into ballet right away. That's cool. So did you ask your parents to get put into dance, or were they like, oh, she would really like this? I, I think I did, and I think it was both kind of a mutual thing of like they always saw me dancing and like stretching and wanting to – like I was such a fidgety kid that I needed to be doing something – and I, my mom had, like, bad experience with gymnastics, and so she didn't want me put in gymnastics. Hmm. So she ended up putting me into dance, and that's how it all started. Very interesting. The love of dance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So then when did, it, when did it become, like, your life mm. with basketball? Because yeah. you, you go – you started when you're five, and then obviously I think the – probably i mean you can tell me if i'm right or wrong but you're going through like the elementary school middle school of just kind of you're just doing it just to do it you know but you're wanted to become of like this is what i eat breathe and sleep yeah that's that's a really good question i would say that would be that would have been around 12 12 years old Mm -hmm. 12 or 13 actually i know for a fact is around 13 years old because I also, I played a lot of different sports. So I played growing up, you know, baseball. I played football for, you know, off and on. I came from a huge football family. That's crazy. Your, your uncle actually was a part of. Yeah. So two of my uncles were in the NFL. Yeah. Um, and they made, they both made like the final cuff, cut stage. This is probably, I'm not, I'm saying probably like 70s, 80s. I'm going to say 70s, 80s, yeah. And so, Yeah. They all played D1 football. They're big boys. They're Yeah, they're huge boys. Yeah. And so, yeah, anyways. But my family, I end up following my brothers, and so they, uh, my brother Mike ended up playing soccer. Mm-hmm. I forget that you, you were a involved. really good soccer player. Yeah, so I ended up actually playing soccer all the way throughout my high school, uh, or through yeah, my high school career and all the way to my senior year. And so played soccer, yeah. So played multiple sports, Mm -hmm. which, yeah, was great because I got to kind of figure out what I like to do. But my top two sports were by far soccer and basketball. For soccer, we are, my class was extremely, extremely good. Mm Mm-hmm. So and we, soccer, the soccer year was different than the basketball year, right? Yeah, so soccer in North Dakota is in the fall, okay. and then basketball is all winter. Okay, so, so that's how you were able to do that. Do too. both, yeah. yep. Exactly. So, do, like, all like the schools, we had traveling teams, and we actually had two traveling teams in town, super competitive, and then U13 year, they ended up bringing both uh, teams together, and so all of us were playing, and with all the parents so supportive and knowing, I guess, our potential, Mm -hmm. we ended up playing in a lot of big tournaments. So we ended up actually qualifying for the regional tournament, the Midwestern regional tournament. We went there, we ended up knocking off like the number 13 team in the country ended up beating South Dakota. And then we ended up losing to like, I think the fifth best team in the country, a Missouri team. Um, But anyways, that was pretty big for a North Dakota team to be able to do that because soccer here in North Dakota is just, thrown underneath the rug nobody really thinks about it but the reason why i explained that story is because i played you 14 year but that you know 14 years old so that was you know gonna go into freshman year of high school 
I had a decision to make, and that was either to go play in like AU basketball and focus mostly on basketball or to continue on the soccer route. And you can do both. No, because it was first financially was super tough because I'd be probably traveling 10 weekends out of the year because soccer was about five or six tournaments during the summer and then basketball is about five or six. Yeah. So anyways, had to make the decision and then I decided to go with basketball. Yeah. So that was kind of the turning point. And then I had well established my goals by that time. So I would say it's about 13 that I wanted to go play college basketball. When you were 13. When I was 13. So maybe that, even younger than that, but because yeah. I know, like growing up as a kid, you always have like dreams, like hey, I want to go play in the NBA, I want to go do all these things, I want to go play for North Carolina. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was probably even before then that I had the dream to go play in the NBA. So therefore, go and play in college. Yeah. So then, when you were thirteen, that's when you made the decision. You're gonna literally eat, sleep, and play basketball. Yeah, and actually, one of the game changing conversations that was had, a uh, kid that was really really good. Um, here in town, we'd always been rivals prior, but he was on our traveling team for a selected number of tournaments. And our coach is actually, was actually Cindy Neff. She's like the best. Really? Like that's some like my most fun, fond memories of basketball she was your coach? for traveling basketball. Hmm. She asked everybody how, like how many hours they play a basketball every single day. And then also how many shots they put up. Mm-hmm. So this kid that I was a rival with said, I go to the Y every single day and I play at least two to three hours of basketball and I put up around anywhere from 500 shots to 700 shots a day. How do you keep count of that? You just, you kind of have like certain drills and you know that there's X amount of shots in each drill. Okay. And so you can mathematically kind of estimate, but it's not like you're like one, two, three, four. Yeah. You're not exactly. I'll lose count. So anyways, that was a huge eye opener to me because... And I actually attest a lot of that to, I think, my work ethic, because then all of a sudden I was like, I'm not working hard enough. Mm-hmm. And comparison is never exactly a good thing, but it's comparison good. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. But anyways. But it can be used. For if it's motivation. used properly, it can be used as motivation. Mm-hmm. So then at from that point on, I said, if I want to get to where I want to get to, I need to do that or better. Mm -hmm. And so that set a fire underneath me. And I was going to the YMCA every single day. Really? Um, And I have carried that throughout my life now. Oh, yeah. Uh, Somebody else is out there working harder than you. You And so you have to, you have to keep on working, which we can attest to. And that's a conversation for another time. Yeah. It's also a really terrible thing and can be very detrimental to you. And when all of a sudden, whatever your career is or your work is, yeah, gets put ahead of everything else and gets put ahead of God, yeah, yeah, it's your life will fall apart, yeah, for sure. But, anyways, enough about me with that question. How about you? I was like, when did you get super, super, super serious? In, and super you serious lit, into yeah, it. I, I would say it was probably like sixth grade, so that was that would be. Is that 11? 12? Yeah, that would be 12. 11, that'd be 12. 11, 12. 11, 12. And that's when, I mean, that's when I mentally got like really serious about it, but I still wasn't the best. I mean, there's obviously people always better than you. And that's when I got my first pair of point shoes. And point shoes are the things you go all the way up on your toes. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was very, I was super young to get my point shoes at my studio. I think I was one of the youngest ones to get my point shoes. And then being in that class, I was 11 years old and there was, you know, 16 year olds that were just getting their points the first time. There was, I think there was like a 21 year old, like they were older people and I was the youngest one in class. And I also, I was jumping levels in dance as well because my dance teacher was like, Mrs. Gasper was like, oh, we want to have her skip a level from dance. So there's, for levels wise, there's level like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like that's how it goes. Or there's uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced. Um, I think there's more above that, but you start off when you're three, you start off as itty bitties usually. So there's itty bitty ballet or it's like pre-ballet, something like that. Then it goes to ballet one, two, three, ballet eight is the top class you can be at. So anyways, when I got very serious into it, it was when I got my first pair of point shoes and 
I don't know. I just look. I looked up to a lot of my dance teachers that were also there. Like we had a pre-professional company also with our studio that was FM Ballet. So you have Gasha School Dance, but then you also have this pre-professional company that had these ballerinas already there. So I'm already looking up to them. So it'd be kind of like you had, you know, NCAA people when you're you're training with them as well mm. every single yep. day, you know. And so I'm looking up to that every single day. And it's like, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. And so I think that's when sixth, seventh grade, I was just sitting there. I'm like, this is what I want to do in my life. And I started to eat, sleep and dream about dance all the time. And I was stretched, like I would literally be at home stretching, watching TV, doing my homework. And then I'd be doing workouts on that. I'm 11, 12 years old, just freaking busting my ass, trying to be what I want to be. Yeah. Wow. So before then, were you living a pretty normal life as a kid? Yeah, I I was. um, I mean, I still like had sleepovers and but I was already starting to be known as Tia the, the ballet dancer. And I was already known as that when I was in first grade. Because I remember my, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Burian, was like, every year I would go up, because elementary school is you know, from kindergarten to fifth grade. That's how it is back in Fargo. And so every year she's like, Tia the ballet dancer, how are you doing? Every single year. And she always knew me as that, and every single teacher as well. Because I'd always have to miss school for rehearsals or something. And that's what... I'd be known as already. So did that, you started to identify yourself then Mm -hmm. as a dancer. I know we've had a lot of conversations about that. Yeah. And that also impacted me. But how did that affect you as just being known as the dancer? I think right away it wasn't too bad. Um, But then when I was in seventh grade, I believe, because we – Dance classes are not cheap. I mean, and my mom and dad could only do as so much at a time, but I was only able to do, I think it was ballet, I think it was ballet, point class, and then a tap class because I really wanted to do tap, and my dad loved tap, and so that's what I started to do. So I was doing three classes a week at the time, which was not that much at all compared to you know some of these people. And I wanted to start doing more. But then when I was in seventh grade, I was like, I want to be considered not just Tia the ballet dancer. So that's when I started to do volleyball, basketball, and track. And I started to do all these different things. Then I think it was the end of like seventh grade. My mom's like, you have to choose either it's ballet or ballet or ballet dance, or you're choosing the rest of the three. And that's including orchestra and choir because I was in orchestra, choir, track basketball and volleyball so i had to choose between those five or just dance Mm -hmm. and i did not even hesitate and i said dance yeah looking back at it now i mean would you change any of that would you do you wish that you would have done any of the other sports longer Mm. no i don't think so because then when i immediately when i turned no i wasn't 13 yet i was 12 Okay, yeah. So I wasn't even on point for that long. But then you could audition for the FM Ballet Company. So this is a pre-professional company. You had to be 13 years old to audition for it. Well, I was only 12 at the time, and my dance teacher was like, oh, he's like, you can just do it. Just audition for it. He's like, just see what happens. Obviously he's saying that, like, you're going to get in for the most part. And so I auditioned, and I got in, and I was a trainee right away. And so that was that was such a huge deal for me that I was like, okay, this is where my life is going to be starting for the dance world, and this is when I decided not to do basketball, track, any of that stuff over there. Hmm. And so that's when it took off when I was 12. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. Because, yeah, I would say like that turning point for me. So, yeah, I mean, obviously the work ethic and having like the dreams, that was a huge game changer in seventh and eighth. I think that was actually seventh grade Mm -hmm. that that changed for me. And then that's when, you know, I started going to Y every single day. But the next game changer was a traveling basketball game. My seventh grade year, I had over 30 points. And then that was kind of like, okay, you can actually do something special with this. Yeah. And then the next one was when I was a freshman. I thought I was just going to be playing JV, Mm -hmm. but the coach that I had 
Shout out to him. Uh, Joe like trusted and believed in me. And so all of a sudden he, I made varsity as a freshman, as a freshman. And so I was playing JV thinking, no way am I going to get any playing time? Like the first game of the season. And here at half, like after halftime, he was like, why is that go out there? And so I ended up scoring like four points that first game. And then finally it really got validated later on the season against century. Who was one of the top teams in the state. And, uh, I ended up having 17. And so then again, it was kind of like a reassurance of like, Hey, your hard work is paying off. Yeah. Like you keep on working hard, keep on the path and you'll be able to do something special with this. Yeah. So from then on, I think I started out with that, that seventh or eighth grade game. Uh, I was all over. It was like, this is going to be like my life. Yeah. I have to play every single day. I have to work my butt off. I'm doing all this research. I am going to go play in college. Yeah. Did you, did you still have like a high school life though with, with b- basketball or did you? Yes, you did? I did. And it made it easier because I limited, you know, sports and soccer. I had like a really good career, but I just pretty much relied on athleticism. I yeah. didn't work on it outside of the sport. Yeah. So during like the season, obviously it was all soccer and then I'd practice basketball off to the side. Um, and then the rest of the year. So that was, you know, three and a half months here in North Dakota. You're focusing on soccer. The other nine were all basketball. Yeah. And so literally from when it would start in or when soccer would end in October, November, from November all the way up until August when soccer would start up again, mm-hmm. playing constant because as soon as the regular season's ended, you're going right into AAU and you're playing all summer long. Mm-hmm. So that those are like your camps. Pretty much. Yeah, so AAU is actually traveling basketball, so okay. that's where you're actually playing games. You're playing games against other AAU teams around the country, and there's okay. tournaments going on all summer long in every single place. So you're playing with like the best of the best. Yes. Okay. And then that's where AAU is huge because that's where college players most recognize you. Mm. Maybe not in like bigger cities and states and stuff, but if you're from North Dakota being this small of a state yeah and you're trying to get your name out there and you're trying to get other colleges to recognize you you have to play AU basketball Interesting. and so with that being said so we actually didn't have a whole lot of AU teams here in North Dakota before then but end up starting one with uh with Maurer shout out Maurer uh so before then I did go to a lot of camps and yeah. I remember for my sixth grade where was seventh seventh and eighth anyways doesn't matter i think it was my sixth grade for christmas i asked my parents the only thing i wanted was a trip to go to these two basketball camps which was one in kentucky Mm -hmm. and one in minneapolis Mm -hmm. so i ended up going with my mom to kentucky that's another great memory of mine seventh grade ended up asking to go back to that kentucky camp um kentucky kansas and then minnesota Went to all three of those, and I actually went on a road trip with my brother for that one. Yep, and then eighth you. grade year, ended up then playing AAU basketball, and then went to a camp in Chicago. Mm. So um, camps, again, were, were good, but I would rather have used that money towards AAU, but it just wasn't available to me at that time. Yeah. So hmm. Interesting. Yeah, without getting too much into it. But yeah, those were some game changing times and really good memories yeah. of being able to, to travel and go on those trips, especially with my family and with my best friends for AAU. Yeah. Would never trade those for anything. Hmm. Yeah, because we, I mean, I guess what I did is that we we did ballet camps or they, they were called ballet intensives. And I never started one until I was 14, I believe. So this is the year after I just joined the FM Ballet Company. So now this is the summer. And you dance. So the, the dance season is all season. It's not just like a short season. It's from the beginning of school of August all the way to June. So that's your season. And that's why my mom maybe had to pick because she's like, I can't have you doing all these different things and, you know, having her run around the place. So, yeah, dance season started in August all the way up to June and then right after you're done with your recital usually sometimes you wouldn't be able to do this recital because your summer camp would start at on June and go all the way till July dang 
Sometimes. Yeah. So then my first summer intensive was in Utah, Ogden, Utah. And that's when I first went to Utah and fell in love with it. And it was a smaller summer intensive. It was like a studio that was kind of like Gaster School of Dance, but it was just somewhere else that I could get training from and not just from the same people all the time. Because you need to have variety of different coaches so that you can learn obviously different things because they only know so much as well. Not saying that my coaches didn't know everything because they did. But, and then, so that was when I was 14. And then 15, I went to Joffrey in New York. And that's the first part of the summer. So I was in Joffrey for, I think it was six weeks, six or seven weeks I was there. And I was dormed with one of my friends and. We, like, lived in the dorms there, and they were just, like, very chill. They're like, okay, just let us know, like, when you leave the dorms and you can go explore New York City. I was 15, (laughs) and they did not care. They're like, just make sure you have a buddy. Like, what? How times have changed. That is crazy. So I was there for about six weeks, and then I had another summer intensive that I needed to go to all the way into California that same summer. That it was – I remember flying from New York City. We went to – back Fargo, back home for Fargo for a day. And then we flew on July 4th all the way to um, California, San Jose. And I was there for another six weeks. Mm, I think maybe four weeks. I don't know. But it was for a long time. So I was there as well because I think I, I think I had a scholarship there, I believe. And that's why I went because it was, I was scholar there. I was also scholared in Joffrey as well. And I don't remember how I, I got scholared. I think it was just an audition that what happened. So backstory or going back you have to audition for these places you can't just go to them and i don't know how it is for camp like for your camps at all like you just sign up and you're able yeah, to go some are invite only same thing with some tournaments but. yeah because like with the these uh intensives like you have to audition for them and they have to say like yep you're allowed to come to our summer intensive or no you didn't make it sorry you'll have to you know, we'll see you next round. So that's the first round of auditions. And then once you get to the actual place, so Joffrey, you have another round of auditions usually for three days. And then they're doing, trying to level you of like where you're going to be leveled out for with everybody. So there's, I don't even know how many levels there were there at Joffrey. It was kind of honestly a mess when I was there. But, and then the same thing with when I was in San Jose. So I was 14, 15, and I got leveled at the the highest level in San Jose, and I was the youngest person. Wow! Yeah, that was cool. That's really cool. It was really. I was like, I was calling my mom. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm the youngest person here, and I just got onto the advanced level. I remember I got noticed a lot, but then also I was always put in the back because I was the youngest person. And they wanted to give everything to the older people, but mm. it was a great learning experience for especially being that young. Yeah, but are you at this age? You're giving away months of your life. Oh yeah. Like, you're not home. You're completely in a foreign place. Yeah. Which probably was a great experience as a kid to travel. Yeah. To be able to experience, I guess, different cultures and different areas. And then... Yeah. Because I remember, like, you're saying that you got to travel with your your parents and your brother and everything. Well, I was flying usually alone. So I flew with my mom the first time. But then I flew back alone. Because obviously she wasn't going to fly back with, like, fly there and then fly back. And then same thing is that... I flew, no, I flew with my mom to, to San Jose, and I think she flew back with me. I'm not really entirely sure. Yeah, because there was an end of the show. But to Utah, I flew back home. So I was 13 years old flying alone. You know, I, I didn't care, apparently. I was just whatever. But, yeah, then you have, I did not have a summer. Then You have all of your friends just going to this lake and having slumber parties and doing all this stuff. And it's like, I never really got to experience a summer at all after the age of 13. That is tough. Yeah. And then going to these places, I'll pretty much alone. I mean, yeah, your mom flew, but then you're on your own for six weeks on a time. Yeah. And you're alone. Mm-hmm. How did that feel? Like, how was that? I mean, you're, you're put into such a difficult situation because you're in a foreign place. Don't know anybody. Yeah. All you have is dance. Yeah. And I think that's why I never regretted not going to college because I kind of experienced all that when I was 
doing these summer intensives because hmm. if you guys didn't know i didn't go to college but it honestly i loved it because I think I got so much social interaction with other people that obviously loved what I love to do, but then, I don't know, you got to, you were eat, sleeping, and dreaming about dance. You woke up, so you were living the ballet life from you woke up at 7 a.m., you ate breakfast, like it was a set schedule of 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., you ate breakfast, and then from 8 to 8.30, you drove to the studio, and you were at the studio, your, your first class probably started at 9 a.m., all the way from 9 a.m. to about 5, 6 p.m. And then you'd go home, you'd rest up, and you'd start the day again. You'd sometimes have it on Saturday as well, and then you'd have Sundays off. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. And it was, that's what it was. You Every single summer intensive was like that. You ate, slept, and dreamt about dance. And it was like four ballet classes, a couple point classes, Maybe like a lyrical class. They would throw in hip-hop classes sometimes for these ballet dances, which is funny because these people weren't the best. <laughs> also, it's blinking, so I don't know if that means anything. What's that? That's blinking. The camera? Yeah. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> and we're back. We ran out of memory on the SD card. Yep. Whoopsie daisies. Anyways, as I was saying, that's how summer intensives were, was just eat, sleeping, and dreaming about dance 24-7. But leaving San Jose that summer, going straight back into the dance season, that's when I started to pick up uh, assisting classes, I'd say. So it's just like helping other itty-bitty classes and everything so I could start paying for more classes um, so I could be dancing from 3 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. every day. So as soon as I got done with school, this would this was eighth grade then. Um, I would always be dancing from 3 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. at nighttime. It was a crazy time in my life. <laughs> That's when it all started, though. That's nuts to think about, especially compared to... Yeah, what was your schedule? My like, training schedule, which I thought it was hard. I mean basketball was, I don't know, I viewed it as like so hard like in your body that you didn't want to overdo it. You didn't want to get hurt, yeah. but you also wanted to have really efficient um, and tough training. So during school, typically what it would be, obviously the season would take so much of our time. So the season was, you know, what a typical basketball schedule would be. So you're lifting three times a week. You are having, you know, during games, you're having two games a week. And then you'd have practice every single day that you don't have a game. Yeah. And so practices, you know, would range from an hour and a half to three hours, depending on what's what's all happening. Now, during like the off season, my off season training would be um, anything from like I'd be going to Healthways every single day, which is another just such such great people were there and that was that changed my look on fitness mm -hmm. and so it was a great like that'd be like my lifting agility all those different things so that would be an hour every single day like the week and then it would be probably an hour anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours of basketball maybe yeah. even more if you know you're playing pickup or whatever but then you'd have au practice when you were able to get all the guys together because we had guys from all around the state so that didn't happen a whole ton but um yeah other than that you'd just go to the y play in a ton of pickup games but then also do like your own training and as you know you went to high school you'd be doing that all at the high school and mm -hmm. you would have all different kinds of things so mm -hmm. typically training ranged anywhere from two and a half hours to about five hours a day um yeah but if it was like on a five hour end i mean that's a lot of time and that's a lot of wear and tear in your body especially if you have to go and do it the next day and with basketball i know that they did this in fargo at davies was it that if your grades weren't um above a certain amount that you weren't able to play oh yeah that absolutely. was a thing okay. yeah and that was for every single sport Fortunately, going to like a private school, a lot of us, I mean, we didn't have to deal with it. And yeah. that's never anything that I had to, I had to worry about. Because dance wasn't like that. They didn't know about our grades because dance was completely away from the school. And so if I was flunking a class, which I, I was never flunking a class, but if I was not doing very well in a class, they didn't know and they didn't care. They still wanted you to dance. You're still going to be performing. 
every weekend or whatever it is. You know, you're gonna be at that dance class, and if you're not, then yeah. shit's gonna hit the fan. <laughs> that's that's how it was. Dang. Um, yeah, because then I actually started competitive dancing as well. So, short story, keeping I guess kind of short story. I you're doing dance classes, and I think I was doing like 13 dance classes a week, roughly. I think it was like 13, 14, I remember counting. So you have your regular dance classes that are just technique classes, you know, getting better. But then now I'm also doing competitive dancing. So the competitive dancing is competition dancing where you're going, you're practicing usually August to like February and then competition season starts in March. And that's when you're going every weekend to go compete against other people and usually win stuff or whatever, just trying to get on stage. But that's on top of usually competition dance practice was on Saturdays all day long. But then on top of that, I was also doing pre-professional, the ballet company, which was also another thing that you're doing shows. So now I'm doing dance classes, competitive dancing, and then shows that we're doing three shows a year, usually like four, four a weekend, which is crazy. Jeez Louise. Yeah, it's insane. But so the competitive dancing... Honestly, it was really, really fun. I, I miss that. And I remember I, I watch it all the time and you see me watching them live streams and everything. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it'd be so fun to be a judge. And I've like reached out to like only one place, but I was like <laughs> <laughs> so many places, so many places. And I was like, Hey, like, can I judge? Like, I, I just miss like that atmosphere of like competitive dancing and just being there. But yeah, so that was a lot of lot of time and so when I hit freshman year that's when I started I think it was like freshman or sophomore year that's when I started to obviously not care about school at all because I knew that dance was my path of like well I don't I don't need to be doing school because school doesn't matter for dance like I just need to be a good dancer I don't need to and they didn't care about our grades so I mean they did they always said that like oh if your grades aren't good then you're not going to compete or something it's like well, they need you because you're the center of the piece, you know? They need you because you're the lead role. They cannot not need you. It was more of an empty end threat. Yes. It wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And I, my mom's threatened me, too, a couple times of, like, if your grades aren't better, like, you're, we're going to pull you from that. But it was always, like I said, an empty end threat. It never went anywhere. And so I never cared about school. I, I passed. I mean, I think my worst grade was probably a C. I had, like, a D maybe for a little bit, but the worst grade was a C, and that was in English. But other than that, it was your favorite subject. Ugh, yeah. <laughs> but so starting sophomore year, that's when I started to do open periods. If that's what they're called. Yeah. So off I, periods. Off periods. So I started requesting off periods at the end of the day so that I could get done with school early, so I could go straight to dance and start private lessons to get better, and then go on to my technique days or having practice for F and ballet or practice for competition dancing or practice for a show. Cause then you would have practice for, sorry, this is a lot, but you would have practice for your shows on Sundays. So you didn't have a day off at all because your practice for on Sundays are usually for, um, I'm trying to think of a show right now, wizard of Oz or Alice in Wonderland. Like you have those days only on Sunday to practice because all the other days are, technique classes or practice for a competition dancing not for a show and a show is usually like two three hours long so you have to have two three hours long of remembering that on top of your other 30 dances that you're trying to remember for competition dance on top of your other 14 dance classes technique classes that you have to remember as well so it was a lot I mean I was very very smart dance wise but not school wise yeah because you're putting all your effort into it oh yes so how did your body feel if you're not even getting a day off, if you're doing it every single day? I, it didn't really bother me at all until I think I hit senior year. And that's when, that's when I was going just insane because insane as in like everything, like obviously I was giving everything, but this is when I'm giving everything my all because senior year now it's like you're trying to look for a company other than the company that you're in right now, outside of the state. So you're trying to go to, let's say, New York City to go dance. You know, you're trying to go to San Jose to go dance or Kansas City. And so you're trying to give it your all. But 
yeah, it didn't really affect my body, I don't think, but I wasn't very smart sometimes when I had an injury, you just pushed through it and you wouldn't say anything because you still want to be at that competition or you still want to be in that show and you don't want someone to take your spot. So it's, it wasn't bad until, yeah, senior year, I'd say. Do you feel any repercussions from pounding your body so hard then and like not doing proper recovery? Or do you think because you're Mm -hmm. so young, your body could just take it? I think the only thing is that like my knee, there was a huge thing in competition world where you do knee drops or they're, I think they're called like death drops. And you literally would just slam down on your knees. And if you didn't do it properly, you, you hurt your knee. And we had them in so many dances. And so my knee would start just like crackling every time. And so now it still does like kind of bug me. But other than that, no, maybe my back a little bit. Cause like I had a slip disc from that which was another story. I slipped a disc and I still danced. That was something. I broke my foot. I still danced. That's another story. But I, yeah, I feel, I still feel great from it. I mean, I don't feel like I'm old and everything, but I'm able to crack like every bone in my body. Literally. It's kind of annoying. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. It's it's not annoying. It's more so like cringy because you yeah. are like, how can you view that? And how is that not painful? Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I'm asking that of course, as a guy, like we don't stretch, we don't do mobility. We yeah. don't do any of that stuff. Like it's a waste of time. We just want to go and play mm-hmm. God. Like, thank God I didn't have a, anything torn, yeah. but I beat up my ankles so yeah. bad. And that my senior year, it was the worst thing ever. Um, it was a really, really tough ending to my career that, uh, I rolled my ankle so bad twice at the end of the season. I was pretty much out. I think I missed anywhere from 10 to like 15 games. Well, rolled ankles honestly hurt worse than actually fully broken yeah. ankles. And I, yeah, I've, I can contest that. That is true. So I can definitely like, I still feel like repercussions working out now, like in my knees, um, when you play like, quite a bit and there's still ball. like quite a bit of like inflammation in my knees. Yeah. Um, actually scar tissue would be the right, there's a lot of scar tissue there, but then you will always hear me throughout the entire house because my ankles crack yes. so much I, and you can just hear them and I can't, there's nothing I can do. Like I try to even yeah. walk quietly, but it's impossible. My yeah. ankles will constantly crack. Mm-hmm. And so now, um, the good thing is that through CrossFit and a lot of, you know, whatever else. Yeah. Um, I have been able to strengthen up a lot of stuff, so I don't really have long-term repercussions, but yeah, definitely thinking about just the beating that your body takes every single day. Yeah. There's definitely going to be stuff that, you know, later down the so line of life. So you went to Augustana your yep. f- first couple of years. Augustana University. Yep. For the first, first couple of years. Two and a half years, and then I took a semester off. Because you rolled your ankle. No, so I didn't get hurt down at Augie. Augie, um, kind of like the highlights there. We won the national championship my sophomore year. Yeah, if you don't know, Augustana is an NCAA. Yeah, D two university. D two. D two college down in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Yeah. So, yeah, I from the moment I kind of stepped on a campus and I just saw their facilities and everything that they're about, how good their education was, I kind of fell in love. And I love Sioux Falls too. It reminded me a lot of North Dakota. It's a beautiful place. And we went there. Yeah. I also wanted to get the heck out of Bismarck. I wanted to get out of town. I wanted to experience something new and I felt like I'd miss out if I stayed here. So out of all the colleges that I toured and stuff, it's like, all right, that was it. Mm-hmm. And so... And you were scholar there, were you? So I had like I th- part scholar Scho- there. Part scholarship yeah, there. Part, part scholarship there. And so the guys that were on our team were just unbelievable. They were so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had a really, really good crew. And so like the guy that was above me ended up being like all American. And we had, I think, had two other all Americans on there. Dang. Which is why we ended up winning the national championship. Yeah. Uh, and so in that third year, obviously with such, like, we had a great coaching staff. We were down to such a routine. Everything was down, like, written down to a fine art. It was 
you know, you have your meal four hours always before a game. And, and if there's a Perkins in that town, that's where we're eating. You're getting the same meal every single time. Really? We're getting to shoot around at least eight hours prior to the game. Um, before the game, we always get there two hours prior. But after our meal, we'd go back to the hotel and everybody would take naps. It was just every right. you do the same thing before every single game. Mm-hmm. Same thing with practices, everything. So, so very different from high school. Very, very different from high school. Oh yeah, stepping up to college, anybody can attest, it's completely different, and everybody is at the now the same athleticism as you are. Yeah. And yeah, if you're, you can get exposed, and so like I got exposed a little bit, and it was a huge wake up call, um, because now it's like you can't, you have to be skilled, you can't just rely on your athleticism. Mm-hmm. But anyways, so learned a ton there. Uh, yeah, won the national championship that third year, just from like the regimens and all this, you know, and just classes were so tough there. Huge step up from high school as well, especially at the level of education that they had there. I just got burnt out Mm -hmm. and it was tough for me because in your mind you have your own plan, which is way different than God's plan. And you're thinking, Hey, I'm going to get done with college in four years, just like everybody else. I'm going to get the dream job that I want. I'm going to find my girlfriend in college and I'm going to marry her. As soon as we get out of college and we're going to have kids, Mm -hmm. we're going to live in the dream home, all these things that you just, it's the typical dream for anybody. Right. But all of a sudden something gets thrown in your plans. You're like, Hey, um, this, I got to do something better for me. Yeah. So anyways, took a semester off really cool. Um, just did a lot of self-searching and also wanted to figure out what I wanted to do because I completely switched up from the major. I was at Augie. I didn't want to waste another semester. And it was tough to step away from everything. It was tough to step away from the basketball team and step away from basketball in general. I didn't know if I was going to play. But I uh, ended up talking with the coaches at the University of Jamestown. Ended up going there for two years to finish out my degree. And so I ended up losing a year of eligibility in there. That's a whole nother story because I played in a scrimmage and exhibition game that half year. Um, so I only had one year at the University of Jamestown. And then I coached the second year I helped to coach. And that matched my my full ride both those years. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, the toughest thing was obviously ending my last season of college basketball of eligibility that I had left um, with an injury on the sidelines for yeah. the last 15 games. And the last, the game that I heard it, I heard it again. So I was out for about eight games and then I heard it again. And I knew in that moment that I was out the rest of the season, regardless of how yeah. we did. And I remember just bawling my eyes out. Really? It was probably top five worst moments of my life. Really? Yeah. And I mean, Maybe I'm exaggerating that because you but know, no, but life is like time, tough, but at that time it was yeah. tough. But you start to realize later on, and this is, I don't know if we'll get to it tonight yeah. with how long this will be, but um, it starts, it becomes your identity. Mm-hmm. It does. And when you put it above God and you put it above family and you start to kind of see that with the amount of hours that you're putting into it, it's, uh, and then you start to also put your value on it. Yeah. So again, people viewed you as, Tia the ballerina people viewed me as Ben the basketball player yeah and so once you hear that enough all of a sudden you put all your value and all your worth on you Mm -hmm. as that thing and you have so much pressure and so you have so much pressure and if you don't live up to the expectations that people have for you now all of a sudden you are worthless and you feel like such crap and your entire life is crumbling before you yeah so it's so hard to change, and that's my biggest advice for kids out there. I tell them that all the time, and every single athlete goes through this. If you're an athlete out there, I'm sure you experience the same exact thing. When you play your last game, you are lost yeah, because you have to completely refine yourself again yeah. and figure out who you are as a person beyond that thing. Yeah, And walking into adulthood, that is a wake-up call. Yeah, it is. That's a wake up call. And all of a sudden, like that sport that you used to play doesn't matter anymore. Now you have responsibilities. Yes. You have to go get a job. You just start paying bills. Now, all of a sudden, like your family and, you know, that's what is like the main priority. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but all in all, if I could go back, you know, I learned so many lessons through the journey that I, I took, um, 
there of course are like things and decisions that I made in the past that I regret and wish I could change, but I wouldn't be here right now and be here mm-hmm. with you and have exactly. Layla if none of these things would have happened. And you have a similar story, which once I finish up, I want to hear <laughs> your story um, that, yeah, we wouldn't be here. Um, and so grateful for like the path, definitely wish I could change up some things, but if there was one thing that I could change, it would have been to put a lot more time actually into my faith Mm -hmm. and always keep God number one. And then also to just make sure that I kept my family and I'm not saying that I didn't, but my family and my true friends as a priority Mm -hmm. through it all. And I didn't leave them on the back burner. Yeah. And so, yeah, I even know that through this entire journey in the path and being the high of like, being such a great basketball player and being popular, mm-hmm. I put even a lot of my friends in the back burner, my true friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to hang out with that popular crowd and follow the the flow of the fame and whatever else and the the praise and all that. Um, and so it's cool now because my best friends and all the guys that are in my wedding, none of those guys were from the popular crowd. Yeah. Those are the friends I put in the back burner and I came back, asked for forgiveness and they're all my best friends now. That's we cool. hang out with them all the time. Yeah, they're awesome. So, anyways, so talking with you, mm-hmm. how t- lead us through like your senior year. Yeah. You're being super intense. You're putting all your time and effort into it. Yeah. You're going all out. You're trying to get um, into a company. Yeah. Yeah. Walk us through that that story. So, senior year, <laughs> kind of junior year as well. Um, a way to also get scouted for these companies, we started to do RCIA, or not RCIA, um, what is it called? I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> I think it's completely different. Um, yep. There's Youth America Grand Prix, which is something completely different with the competition dancers. And then there's also, it's another big like uh, festival, Mid Midwest Festival. Mid something I don't know, but so we you go away for like two weeks during the school year, and you usually you go with your company, and there's you like company directors out there that are scouting. So they're scouting for dancers. So you're dancing again from nine a.m. to five p.m. to get scouted from these people, and then you're also putting on. You have one big like uh, dance piece that's usually like fifteen minutes long that you're putting on at the show so that people can see like, Hey, I want that dancer. I want her or I want him or whatever. Um, so then we started doing that and I can't for the life of me, RC it. No, or it doesn't matter. I'm going to look it up tonight though. And I'm remembering it's gonna <laughs> bug me. anyway. So then we started that junior year also did it senior year, I believe. And my junior summer though, I went to Kansas city ballet and that was a really big move because I had, I had a scholar from that, from this festival that I was talking about because they scouted me out, wanted me to go there to see training with them and how I'd fit in. And so I was training with the Kansas City Ballet number two company. So there's there's two companies. The company number one is obviously the best. And then company two was still very, very good. And so, again, got there, had a re-audition to see where I placed. I placed at the top of the plate. I got the most advanced on there. And yeah, that was, I think that was a big moment for me of saying like, wow, I'm actually not being cocky, but I'm like, I'm actually really good that I can do this, that I can, this company right now is scouting me out and I could be a part of their company next year. And so that was junior year summer. So you're going to be a senior right now. So now I come home and I start, that's when I started my fitness journey per se, because of my brother, he was eating rice and chicken was becoming like a bodybuilder. So now I'm starting my fitness journey, but then also it wasn't the best journey because it went into like some not eating the best because I'm not eating anything. And that's a whole different story that I, that does not need to be going down at the moment. <laughs> um, so anyways, now I'm getting done with school at 1 p.m., so I could dance from 1 p.m. to 9, 30, 10 o'clock at nighttime. And I started to, I think I won every single competition that year at dance for all my solos and everything. Because I was just doing solos. I wasn't doing anything else. I was just like group numbers. And I think I won 
every single competition that year. And my junior year, I think I did too. Dang. Yeah. I think. And Ruthless. It was, it was, it was pretty cool. That's, <laughs> that's where I got my crowns. Anyways, doesn't matter. But senior year then, um, I auditioned for, I think, a f- like four or five companies. So you send in videos or you can like go into personal ones. And then I had a couple more that summer that I was supposed to do. Well, then I graduated June 8th, I think. I think it was like June 8th. Um, and then my father actually passed away June 10th. And that was kind of a huge wake up call of like, Hey, what do I want to do with my life? And honestly, I think beforehand too, I got into a relationship that the senior year in like November and it kind of deteriorated. It wasn't deterring me away from dance, but my focus wasn't fully on dance though as well now. Mm -hmm. Cause now I'm like in this relationship that I'm trying to like figure out, but then I'm trying to figure out what do I want to do? Do I want to stay in Fargo? Do I want to go out and dance, but do I want to be with this person? And so that was, that was tough trying to juggle that. Um, and my full attention wasn't into dance, but it was, but it wasn't, you know, you were distracted. Yeah. I was just, I was, there was a huge distraction. And my dance teacher always told me that too. He would always say no boys until you're 35 (laughs) all the time. Dang, he always 35? said, I'm not even 35 now and I'm married and have a child, but he loves you. So 11 years too. I know. But so then my, my father passed away and I had a lot to think about. Um, and I took, I took a year off of dance and there's, yeah, there's a lot of, I, I'm trying to like think of the word to say of there's people that are still upset that I did take that time off. Um, and not my dance users or anything, like, they totally understand, but there are some people that are, like, I don't know if they still are upset, but I don't know if they realized what I was going through. It wasn't just, like, my dad passed away from a sickness, so, like, he passed away from committing suicide, so it was completely not, un- it was unexpected, you yeah. know? Oh, yeah. So it was something that I needed to figure out, and we didn't have the best relationship, so I was blaming it on myself, and anyways, um, so I'm still in this relationship, kind of we broke up broke off and on a lot of stuff that went on that shouldn't have went on we've already talked about that yep if you know you know (laughs) (laughs) anyways um so i took that full year off of dance came back and danced for another year or two so then 2017 and then COVID happened 2020 right yep yeah 2020 and that was kind of my last show and I the thing is like you knew yours was the last time you're gonna play basketball I didn't know my last time I was gonna step on stage and that was the last time I stepped on stage but actually I have to kind of go back a little bit though I also competed in bodybuilding and I stepped on stage for bodybuilding so I got to dance for bodybuilding but then also like put a swimsuit on and compete um but I think the tough part for me right now still is that I didn't know the last time I was going to step on stage and I'm still like wanting that urge of like, I want to have that last time I step on stage and knowing it's the last time or just like, Uh, like a feeling of closure. Yeah. I want a closure, but then also like, I don't want it to be closed still. So it's still, it's, I don't know. It's, it's still tough. I mean, we've talked about this too with Mm -hmm. after me having Layla, it's like, I still want to do something. I still want to get back on that stage and do something. So it's, yeah, so that's how my career kind of deterred away from being in a company. But I'm also really glad. I'd never want to be in a company ever again because if I was in a company, I'd probably be hospitalized because it's either by hurting myself because you push your body so much. You only get to like be a dancer until you're 30 because your body's just going to be wear and tear. I mean, you can't have a social life really because you're dancing 24-7. You can't have a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever because you're dancing 24 7 you can't have a family you can't have a child like you're living usually very very minimalist as in like a one bedroom maybe studio apartment because you're not getting paid anything so that was a huge wake-up call like do I really want this or what do I want in life and I really wanted a family and be married and to put this all into perspective of how big of a decision this was of not going off and not going to college where did you have scholarships to? So I had one from Kansas City 
valet. And that's where I went to my so- or junior year summer. So they offered me back to be in the training program. So that was like, you're going to be training with the a company there, which was a huge deal. You're not getting paid right away, but you're training with a company. Um, and then I had one for UCLA. I never even auditioned for them. And that's UCLA, the one they only take 12 men and 12 women. Wow. Out of the entire U.S., I believe. And I don't know how they like found me or what they did. That sounds like very, very cocky, but <laughs> I'm not trying to be like that. But I remember getting an email saying like, hey, like we've seen your videos and everything. And they're like, we want you to be a part of UCLA. And so that was that was really cool. And then I had one for Joffrey as well. But Joffrey was just now Joffrey is just Joffrey because it's not even that big compared to UCLA and Kansas City Ballet. Yeah. So, yeah, it was those were the by the three main ones that yep. I had that I was going to be going to. I had some in Minneapolis that I auditioned for, but that's when I was just auditioning for in Minneapolis. Cause I was trying to be close to home. Sure. And they were just companies that I could have just gotten into because it they were just in Minneapolis. They weren't anything big, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was a big decision, but when we met them, cause we were still, we were still coaching. Like you were coaching basketball yep. and I was coaching dance and I was still like dancing here and there. And I think when we met and we were able to both relate about everything, it helped me though, like kind of close everything as well. Yep. And kind of like, Hey, like, this is the end of your life. You've danced for, you know, 18 years of your life. It's time to close it down. But also I don't want it to close it down. Like I still <laughs> want to be dancing right now. It's, it's tough. It's very, very tough. It is difficult. You know, we've had that. We've had many conversations about it. And I feel for you that closure would be a huge thing, yeah. but also, I understand the same feeling in basketball of wanting to be out on that floor again, wanting to be in front of like sold out crowds. Yeah. And also having like the feeling of, again, you know, that dunking, rush. dunking, yes. hitting a pull up jumper, hitting a three, you know, all those things and being around like your teammates, all those feelings and those nostalgic feelings that it's nuts to think about that we were feeling since we were, you know, the beginnings of it five mm-hmm. and even younger you know, it's your entire life up to that point. So you've only lived, you know, God willing, a quarter of your life, but your entire life has revolved around this one thing. Yeah, because that's all that's all we've known, though, from from three or five to, you know, 20. Like that's been our entire life. Now we're we're living, per se, a normal life. And it's only been three years and I'm still adjusting right now. Yeah. And it's a tough it is a tough, tough realization that you know when you're a kid you have the ability to only focus on that you have the yeah. ability to only dance and only play basketball you don't have to worry about bills bills and all and this kind of stuff all the other drama that comes with adulthood getting a job etc that is your job yeah that's essentially and that's even the way that i looked at basketball too is that i want to get a college education that's basketball will pay for that that and was so, my job too i was technically working more than uh i think it was like 50 or 60 hours i was dancing a week it was crazy a lot and then on top of that you have school that you're doing which is technically that's already a full-time job on top of that so it's it was ridiculous and same thing with basketball but i think that like i don't regret it because it's shaped me who i am today and everything happens for a reason that like how we met you know it's like i wouldn't have gone to Vegas or I wouldn't have moved here or anything like that. But yeah, I would never want to be in a dance company ever again, but I still think that I still think in these next years, I will be on stage again doing something. I went to a ballet class like the week of our wedding, just because you remember that? Yeah, I do. You remember that? Cause I was like, I need to do a, a ballet class. I need to do it. And I was, I was so psyched. I was rusty but i was so psyched to do that again i just i just think there's nothing here in bismarck for me to even just like doing something like weekly or monthly like that like see i'm thinking with you like doing pickup basketball of just like getting out there there's nothing here so i have a kitchen that's all i have so so if my daughter wants to dance she's learning (laughs) from me 
And so there, that's something more that we're going to discuss in the future. I know with basketball, it's funny now because being 27, the biggest fear that you have is playing City League and tearing an ACL or You've something known like that. Multiple friends that have done that. Yes, I do. And being out and having to get workers count or like whatever, like you have to get short term disability. Yeah. Yeah. That is your fear and being out for months and having to go through rehab and just the amount of time and stuff that goes with that. But if you had to give any advice, about being a basketball player and like kind of living and you know living that yeah. lifestyle that you did what advice would you give to younger generations or just to people trying to heal from it yeah i would say never like don't deter from like your dream is and don't you know because of the whole identity thing never steer away from that but always have your priorities yes. right and yeah. in correct order so understand that when people say, yeah, you know, Ben, like the basketball player and like, no, it's Ben, you are a son of God. Like you are, you first play and basketball, foremost, you play yeah. basketball, but that's such a small part of who you are yes. and people will realize that and to live your life that way as well. Yeah. Because I know my parents would always say that as well, that, um, like, yeah, you want to be the greatest basketball player that you want to be, but you also want to be the greatest human being that you can possibly be. And so you want people to know like, yeah, dude, he's, he's a great basketball player, but he is such a better man than he is a basketball player or like he did this or that, you know, the other thing that having those priorities, right. Making sure that yes, figure out train four or five hours a day, but make sure that you're not missing like church on Sunday that you're not that your life comes first before basketball. Yes. And they're like all that kind of stuff. No, I totally agree with, with that. I mean, I, I always made sure with, um, the kids at the studio and just being, I mean, the, the elder or like the peer and my peer, or what would that be? The person that's kind of uh, role model, the like. role model. Yeah. Being the role model now, since all the other people that I looked up to, they left. Um, and they honestly weren't the best role models. I mean, they were very rude to me and just, they were just whatever. But after they left, I always made sure I said, since they never gave that to me, I always want to make sure to give it to mm. the kids down below. And so I always like, would stay longer and watch the kids practice so that I would be there. So I knew every single kid's name. Like I literally would practice the kids' name so that I would remember them. I remember, cool. I remember the mom's names too, because I was like, the moms are always there too. So it was just, it was a really great community with that aspect of just, I don't know. And I think that's probably where my giving came in. Cause I just, I loved kids and I love to give everything to them. Yeah. But, and that's great to put that ahead. Yeah. And I, and that's what, I think I always tried to make sure when I was dancing, it's like, yes, I was Tia the ballet dancer, but then at the studio, I was like, I was also the very loving and, you know, the generous person being there and not just the, the Snoopy principal dancer back there, you know? So it was, yeah. If I had to give, I guess, advice of being a ballet dancer was kind of similar to yours of don't make it your identity, especially it's tough though, because if that's going to be your career though, it's, it's very, very tough. It is it's, tough. But even with our careers now, we are yeah. understanding that, you know, with being a filmmaker and being a photographer, yeah. that that is not our identity either. Like if I were to lose filmmaking tomorrow, yeah, I hope that I have something beyond that. Yes. Then just, you know, and I, I think like to always either, if you're going to follow that path to be a ballet dancer in like the company or anything like that have a backup plan always have a backup plan and do other things, have other hobbies of not just ballet or dance, just have other hobbies or hang out with friends outside of dance that don't talk about dance. And so you can identify yourself somewhere else and not just the studio. Yes. Cause life will, it will never be a perfect balance, but there's always opportunities to balance out your life as best as you possibly can with, friends yeah. family and whatever sport you is yeah or it you is choose, yeah because my last advice would be to realize that it's just a game mm-hmm. and it's just a, a, a show a show yeah because regardless of whoever you are 
if you are LeBron James, LeBron James will play his final game. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that, it's who is LeBron? Mm-hmm. He's got to answer that as well. If you're a dancer, you said a majority of people's careers are only until like they're 30 years old because their yeah. body won't hold up. There will be a last show. There will be a last game. And there's always going to be an 11 year old that is better than you. <laughs> yeah. That's how it was for dance. There's always going to be a 11 year old or somebody in Russia or anywhere that is better than you. Or there's someone always better than you no matter what. Yep. You're not always, you're, even if you're the best in North Dakota or in the US, there's someone always better than you. So always, yes, realize that mm-hmm. and don't let it deter you from like your love of, of dance or the love of basketball and also yeah. view it as such. View it as a game. Don't view it as your life. Yeah, exactly. I like that. But thank you so much, you guys, for coming to this podcast tonight. I think it was a good one. It was. We this kinda, was deep. This I like it. Good. It's kind of healing though for me too. Yeah. So I, I liked it, but... Thank you again. Like and subscribe. Comment down below whatever you think that we should talk about next. Yep. But we will see you in the next podcast when it's finally nighttime. Good Good night. night.